Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Every week, I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in, and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well, because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And uh, today we have a super special show for you, especially if you're looking to understand more about how to build a team, how to go out, communicate with the team. We have an absolute expert in this area. Uh, actually, on today's show, we have Sep Bakam, who's going to, to be here. We're going to talk to you a little bit more about Sep. So when you're looking to understand more about this, the area of teams, team building, we're really here and going to have a wonderful conversation with Mr. Sep Bakam. Sep, welcome to, the, uh, welcome to the Going Long podcast. Thank you very much, Billy. Thank you for having me on here. So this is, for me, this is a, um, this is just a joy uh, because Sep, I think you you know, uh, but you've been an inspiration for me in terms of uh, becoming a, a real estate investing uh, entrepreneur and continue to learn, grow with, and, and as a result of interactions with you. So I'm sure that it's going to be fantastic for everyone that's watching and listening today. So i um, really excited about having you on the show. And I know you've done a lot of things as, uh, as the founder and CEO of the, uh, of the Become Investment Group. Um, being based in Orange County, California, you've done a lot of different things. You've even had a chance over the last decade or the over the last decade as a real estate investor, um, gone, walked away from your uh, corporate role and into growing and working with others to have a larger impact. Uh, these are just a couple of the things, right? And you're, you're really focused right now on solving a specific problem in the affordable housing uh, area. And I would love for you to help connect with the Going Long listeners and viewers and help us to understand a bit more about you, Sep. All right. Well, my pleasure, uh, Billy. Thank you very much. And it, and it is a mutual feeling. So I get as, uh, you know, uh, as much uh, value just from you and being so humble and, you know, sharing uh, your expertise as well over the years. So it's, it's definitely a two-way street. So uh, I guess specifically as far as, you know, the value, well, you know, where to, where to start off with, is it more, uh, do we want to start, you know, way back when getting started or? Well, I just like to give, uh, yeah, let everybody get in a, a sense of kind of where you got started, where the light kind of came on from a real estate investing perspective, and also kind of tell us a little bit about your journey and what's brought you to today. Sure. So I got started, uh, ironically, close to 10 years ago, in, uh, right in the midst of the 2008 uh, recession. So I just graduated out of college and got my first job in, I think that was June 2000, 2008. And then I got laid off from that a couple months afterwards. That was right when Lehman Brothers was collapsing and you know, there was all the, the changes and the chaos in the market. Uh, and I had, I had whatever money I had I, I, you know, that I was saving, I put into the stock market and I didn't really know which stocks to, to pick. So I asked my coworker, it's like, well, what are you investing in? And he's like, well, I don't know. I follow my uncle. He said that my, my uncle is, is very well off and he's putting a lot of money in Washington Mutual. And for any of the listeners based in Europe, that, that's a, a former bank uh, <laughs> in the U.S., <laughs> Uh, I don't know if they got bought out or they went under, but they, they didn't do too well in 2008. And that was not a good company to invest in back then. So, uh, you know, I, I went through college. I studied electrical engineering. I could do calculus. I could do physics. But I, I couldn't explain what a mortgage was. I didn't know what a amortization calculator was. I didn't know how to make an offer on a property. To this day, I don't have a real estate license. I don't have an MBA. Uh, so I, I did get curious about real estate investing. But I always thought at that point... Like, all right, well, I don't want to be in the stock market. I'm, I'm just going to go save up and put a down payment for a house because prices are cheap. So I went to the bank, not Washington Mutual. Uh, I went to every one of their competitors and I was like, look, I've, I've uh, been out of college for five, six months now and, you know, I have a job now. Uh, you know, how much can I qualify for? And they did the calculations. They're like, well, you're going to need two years of pay stubs. So two years of income in order to qualify. And you're going to need like a 25% down payment. So what you can afford right now Back time, you know, back then, living in Orange County, it's like it's even even the prices were lower back then. They said 
you know, what, it was like a $200,000 loan and that you could qualify for like a closet in Orange County. That's not a whole lot of space because of how expensive it is. Mm-hmm. So I, I got bummed by it and I just kept working the job. And, and then I, it got to the point where I had some goals, but I was just trading time for money. And I was like, I want to raise my income. The only way I know how to do that is I either have to get a raise or I got to go for an, an MBA or a master's degree. So I went back to school and um, I was getting burnt out, 40 hours working for my job. I was working for, you know, uh, just spending a lot of time in traffic, going for my master's. And then um, I met with a friend and, and then she kind of realized that I was, I was getting burnt out. She's like, what's your goal? I was like, I, I just wish I wouldn't have to worry about money just to survive. Like I'm not, I'm not living a millionaire lifestyle. This is just to put food on the table and to, I, mean, I couldn't even afford to move out of my parents' house at the time. You know, I had to just save up. Um, and she's like, well, you're trading time for money, but you know, if the end goal is to not worry about it, uh, what if, what if that goalpost keeps moving? Cause you, you think that she was basically explaining to me what inflation was. She was like, you, you think that you need X number of income per month, but if, if the cost of food goes up, if the cost of rent goes up, you know, if the, your purchasing power decreases over time, then having your goal tied to money is not really the best financial decision. And then uh, she threw me a curveball and she said, did you know the Federal Reserve is not federal or a reserve bank? And I just paused because that reminded me of the, mo- the, the movie, The Matrix, where, where Morpheus is sitting there with Neo and, and he, he says, you know, you could take the blue pill and you go back to yeah, how the reality was before. You could take the red pill and you'll see the truth behind the curtains. So when she said that, I just paused and wondered. It's like, here I am. I'm spending every day just, you know, either working for this job or studying for this master's degree to earn these little Federal Reserve notes, these dollar bills. And, um, and then when she started talking to me and just educating me on it, she's like, it becomes worth less and less over time. I mean, you could go to Harvard for $400 tuition 60 years ago. Now you need $40,000 per quarter. Um, you know, eggs don't cost 10 cents us anymore they cost you know 25 cents 50 cents per egg so she recommended i read this book by robert kiyosaki conspiracy of the rich and um that that really just changed everything it's like rich dad poor dad um like an advanced guide to that because it just got me thinking in terms of i got to prepare myself for inflation and then you know uh, hedge myself by investing in real assets by not being dependent on a job but buying real estate that cash flows that that has lumber, it has oil that goes into the, the roof, you know, it has labor that goes to build the properties, it's got granite, you know, all of these are commodities, right? So all of those hold their, their value over time. And um, yeah, I mean, kind of, we, we can go into more details on that, but that, that was kind of where I got started and where, where I took the, the red pill. I was going to say, you go back to the red pill and the blue pill and, and, and taking the red pill. But there are a couple of things that you talked about, right? It's in, and I think it's important that just having, making enough money to be able to survive, right? That is, that is something that was a driver, was a main engine for you so that you weren't just dependent on a job. You'd gone through that in 2008, right? When you were, you were getting started, uh, you, you had I guess an interesting investment opportunity that kind of, kind of blew up, I guess. And, um, and then, yeah, you, you, you saw, you projected your life and what it was going to be like. And you realized that, you know, it was time to take a look behind the, uh, behind the curtain and really uh, learn more uh, than what was going on. So you talked about, I think $200,000 for a, for a closet in Orange County. Right. And eventually I know that one of the things that you have started to do and really building your expertise is being able to go long, go beyond Orange County and understand uh, maybe some other opportunities. So, so Seth, can you talk to us a little bit about what, what was the driver for you to look to go beyond Orange County? Maybe what were some of the challenges that you initially found in that? And then kind of how is that working for you today? Good question. So I, I just naturally, I looked at my immediate backyard. So Orange County, it's up there with New York. It's up there with San Francisco, Rome, uh, probably even Barcelona. These are very expensive, mature cities, right? Mm-hmm. They're not what we call emerging markets. Um, they're not, they're not markets that are, that are, you know, at low price points and just on the verge of, of going through a, an incline, either in population or job growth. Well, I, because I didn't know, what to look for. You know, I was, I was scared to go even invest out of my, 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 my close city or the state. 
But when I couldn't find deals in Orange County, I started going in the surrounding areas. So looking at LA, looking at what's the Inland Empire, which is cheaper prices. But the Robert Kiyosaki books talk a lot about cash flow. So you want to invest for cash flow. And then the further out I got, um, the numbers started making more sense. But I realized if I'm staying in California, I'm still limited. That's one drop in the bathtub of opportunities. So I want I want more opportunities. So um, instead of just you know going and jumping and buying a deal, I got financially educated. Like Robert Kiyosaki talks about, I started listening to podcasts. I read books that were mentioned in the podcast. So for any of you listeners out there, you know, if Billy Keels says, read this book, read that book. Um, I, I think it's uh, just as important, you know, listening to the podcast and the personal development or, you know, real estate investing books and all that, just so you can learn from other people's experience and, and mistakes and, uh, you know, see the opportunities. So as I got more financially educated, I, I started, uh, you know, I would focus on one or two markets out of state. And the first market I, I jumped into was Phoenix, Arizona. And that was back in, so that was back in 2010, I bought two multifamily properties or two fourplexes side by side. So it was eight units, you had eight different tenants and I bought them from what's called a turnkey provider. And the big, a big part of my journey is that there is no such thing as a turnkey property. There is, you know, unless you have, unless you have Starbucks at a retail shopping center, you know, and Starbucks is going to take care of the maintenance you know, most real estate is going to require professional management and it's just a lot of moving parts. It's not automatic. Actually, Seth, you know, I, I want to just it's kind of stop here just for a quick second, because I think already we're starting to see a, a pattern in terms of you saw that once again, there was a limited opportunity. you would seen that before, but in terms of your ability to grow beyond inflation, now it is beyond your backyard in Orange County or LA. And so you're now looking for the opportunity to expand your horizons. That's now taking you to a, a place outside of your home state, right? And to, to Phoenix, Arizona, and you're now dealing with a concept. And, and then I'd just like for you to help our viewers and listeners understand when you talk about a turnkey provider, what is a turnkey provider? And then from there, maybe if you can help to uh, talk a little bit more about uh, this story. Let's see, like a turnkey provider, it's, it's like, um, Apple is a turnkey provider. You could think of it that way. Apple, Apple is not known for having the most cutting edge iPhone technology, right? They're really good at assembling everything together. Sorry, assembling everything together and making it easy to use, and and it's reliable, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so Apple is something where you don't have to go physically change the battery of the phone yourself. You don't have to go source different LCD screens from China. Apple, Apple already took care of that, right? So they spend years of development and they deliver a, a good turnkey product. That phone is, is good. It's always going to work. Turnkey providers in real estate are, are basically, you could think of them as flippers where it, it's basically flippers, but instead of just flipping and providing the property, they also provide the property management and they, they position it. I, you know, I, I'm going to sound kind of pessimistic about it it's because I've lost um, I've lost a lot of time and money uh, investing in turnkey properties. They position the properties to the investors that you you can just sit back and collect the checks. That it's just going to cash flow automatically. And uh, the reality is, you're going to have vacancies. You are going to have tenants move out. Um, you're going to have to like to date. I've gone through 15 property management companies. Uh, so the first turnkey. Uh, provider that provided me with the property management company, I kept that bad property manager too long. I kept them for a year. And as we had problems, they would always, it was always someone else's fault. It's like, oh, you know, we had the wrong tenant in there, or it's because, you know, they, uh, the tenant lost their job, they couldn't pay the rent. And there's always an excuse with it. Uh, at the end of the day, it, it does fall on me. So it's, it's the investor's fault. And the investor's responsibility is make sure you have, as Jim Collins says, you have the right team on the bus. So if you have, you can have a good property and you can have a bad property manager. You could have the bad team and they will destroy that property. You can, you can be in a good market, good property, bad team, and you'll have a bad experience. But if you have a good team, you can be in a good or bad market. You can have a good or bad property and you'll have a good investment overall because they can handle it. Perfect. So it does come down once again to team. When you look at the turnkey provider, they are basically providing you with a, I guess, as you said before, I love the, I love that analogy of when you're looking for a, a phone or a smartphone, uh, Apple is someone who provides you with that and so that you don't actually have to go out and pick up each one of the different components. 
and you ultimately get the result that you want, which is to be able to either make phone calls, send WhatsApps or, or whatever the case may be. So that's what the, the turnkey provider is. And so really interested, you talked about 15 different property management companies that you've worked with. And I guess with each experience, you gain better and more expertise, right? right. Um, and so you were talking about the, the, the Phoenix experience. So maybe if you can continue with that, with that Phoenix experience and just uh, help us understand how that initial um, situation ended. Sure. So I, I think it's really important for the investors just to understand the numbers, right? Where's the money coming into the properties and where's the money going out? And then what's left over is your cash flow. And whatever a broker, a real estate agent or a turnkey provider shows you is called the pro forma. So pro forma. And it's basically it's their interpretation of the numbers. So if they make the cash flow look high by by artificially increasing the income that's shown on the paper or the projections and artificially you know, making the expenses look cheaper, then it's, it's gonna look like it's gonna be a, a better deal. So with, I guess with that experience, it's just knowing that there's, there's a, you, have to, you have to know how to optimize the property. You have to know how to manage the property and be able to, uh, to improve it from there. Um, now that's my train of thought from that. Uh, can you repeat your question one more time? Yeah. So you, so you're talking really about the, in terms of the, the experience in, in Phoenix and you are helping us to understand really on the pro forma. So there are certain right. things that can be presented in a certain way, but you're also helping us up in terms of building a team and looking to build for the team. You're helping us to understand that pro forma is, is someone's interpretation of what the numbers could be, either the money going in or the money going out. And then you're helping us to understand that ultimately you wanna be able to optimize each individual opportunity. So whichever problem you're looking to solve, which translates into a property that you're going to purchase, you wanna make sure that you have, uh, that you're focused on um, being able to ask the right questions of that team member. In this specific case, it's the property management company. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So even uh, so, let's say if you go into a deal, then you have you have you're, you're buying it based on pro forma. You're you know if the numbers aren't as good after you buy it compared to what you thought it would be. If you have the right team, then you can you can be able to optimize or reposition the property and improve it. So it's not the end of the world. So I think that that was a big part of uh, of having to go through multiple property management companies. There was a couple times where we could have easily walked away from the property and let it go into foreclosure, but by bringing on the better team and changing the game plan, you, you have to pivot. Um, you know, maybe, maybe this is not a community where you just do um, laminate countertops. Maybe it's something where it requires granite and you can boost the rent and increase the value of the property. So just being able to make sure that, you know, as the, as the investor, that you have the right, right team to be able to oversee the asset and uh, adjust to the market changes. Okay. So having the right team on the bus. And I love that uh, allusion to Jim Collins, wonderful book, good to great. And, um, you know, I think it's one of the things when, when you're looking at team building, right. And you've been able to do this and we'll get to that because you've been able to do it to a point where from Orange County, you've gone one state and now you're in multiple states. So, so help us understand through your experience, what are some of the key factors that can help to contribute to uh, working with a successful team? So um, some of the key factors is knowing what it's like to, you know, try to try to see what it's like from your team's perspective. Uh, a lot of like, so I've, I've, of those 15 property management companies, I've been fired by two property management companies. So it's, it's rare to hear that mm -hmm. an investor gets fired from a property manager. Most of the time when people think property management companies, they think they're either good or they're bad. Mm -hmm. And it's just the investor who makes a decision to hire or fire them. So I, I've been let go by two property management companies. That's very scary because when a property management company quits, it's not when things are good. It's when things are bad. And, you know, for another property management company to take over, it's like picking up a falling knife. So when what's helped strengthen the relationships with the property management companies and and optimize the assets and make it better for the tenants and the investors is is finding out how do they make money and helping them make money um you know, and they got to be transparent about it they can't be doing secret deals they can't be you know uh, telling you that the price is one price and then they're making money off of another vendor like all that has to be disclosed because at the end of the day, it, it, it's not going to work if the investor is just making money and the property manager is losing money managing our rentals. Or the same thing with the contractors. So we want to keep everyone 
for the long run and, and, you know, keep everyone profitable. Um, and, you know, just be able to see what it's like from, from their shoes. So it's, so that it's, it's just, you know, you got to treat it like a business, even if it's one property, if it's 10 properties, you know, look at it in terms of how, how can you improve it? And, um, you know, how can you, how can you bring the right people on the bus? Hmm. It, you know, Sep, so being able to bring the right people on the bus, a lot of what you're saying really ties into the abundance mentality that you have, right? Because this is one of the things I just love the fact that you, you said, how can you make sure that the property management company is making money, right? What is it you can do as an investor to make sure that they're making money because you want to help them make money? I, to me, that's like, Platinum. That that goes beyond gold. This is like really, really a, a, a one major knowledge bomb that you're that you're helping to drop here. So, t- help us understand maybe what you mean by that, and if you can give us an example of how you are working and also focused on making sure that when you're working with a team member, property management company, that they're also making money. Yeah. Well. So the the look at, looking from the property manager's perspective, let's say if you're if you're working with the property manager and they have they have two thousand uh, properties that they manage, and I and I know it sounds like a big number, but that, that's the type of property management company you want to work with. You don't want to work with property management companies who are just starting out, or they maybe only have like they're only managing twenty or thirty properties for twenty thirty investors because. Uh, the single point of failure is if they get sick, if they can't go to work or if they're on vacation, then their business stops and then management for your property stops too. So if you work with a bigger company, you get economies of scale. So you get after hours, uh, emergency maintenance calls, you get an accounting team in in house, um, you know, full-time leasing agents. So, um, from their perspective, you know, what, like I'll give an example. One of my property managers in uh, Kansas City, their leasing agents uh, made six figures last year just on leasing six hundred dollar house uh, rentals. So that's awesome. I mean, if if they're you know getting really good money, that's more than uh, what I thought leasing agents could make. That's frankly, that's more than what I made as as an engineer seven years in college. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's it's stuff like that. Like that translates to you know if they're doing if if they're you know, really motivated to go lease your vacant apartment, mobile home, house, shopping center, whatever it is. That's great. You don't want the ones who who they're starving. Um, you know, and they're not they're not really making the sales. Um, the other thing too is is just from you know the time is money as well. So even just the the phone call, being cognizant, like if they're taking your phone call, they're not working on something else. So you can get on a routine. Um, it could be you know you just find out a time of the week that works well with the property manager or, or you know, the, uh, the contractors, whatever it is to have those update calls to stay on them. Cause it's not just you hire them and you, you give them, um, you know, the keys to the house, you still have to manage them. Right. Um, one of my favorite Trump, um, Trump quotes, and I'm, this is not a political statement, you know, this has nothing to do with his, his, uh, politics or anything like that. But as a real estate investor, he was, he was a very savvy real estate investor. He said in one of his books, hire the best people, and don't trust them. Um, and it sounds like something Trump would say, but you know, it doesn't matter if you like him or not. Um, that that's very golden advice because what that's saying is that you could have the best people on the bus, um, and things can change. And I'm going through that right now uh, with a lawsuit with a former, former property manager. We were with them for uh, close to four years, and mm-hmm. year three, you know, they started getting really greedy, and you know, that's the point where you know if. You know, if people are, are short term and you, you're thinking long term, then it's not a good match. And that's when the attorney is going to evolve, unfortunately. So definitely good to just see it from from the property manager's perspective and, you know, treat, treat it as a third party entity, not not as if, you know, they're not family. Right. But we want to we want to treat them like family, but they're they're, you know, you, you have to be able to let them go if, if they can't perform. Yep. They are. Uh, yeah. That, I mean, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So, it, you know, when you're looking at things like. Um, being able to work with teams that are allow will allow you to, to scale. All right. So there's a certain kind of minimum number that you, you found that really works. So the types of company that have thousands of units or two, like 2000 uh, in their portfolios can allow the economies of scale, can allow to be able to have in-house staff that can uh, respond to needs in a timely fashion. You talked about time being something that's really critical. And so being able to, to react and be proactive in a timely fashion is something that's key. And then there's also another take on that on that Trump quote, which is 
trust, but verify. Right. Right. Um, you know, that, that, that is, we trust that things are going to be done, but ultimately when you're managing that member or that team managing your managers, then you need to be able to, to trust that they're going to do some things. And at the same time, follow up and verify that things are getting done. Right. And, right. Um, so I think that those are, those are um, nuggets once again, and that they're helping us understand more and more about the team. So I know we're talking a lot about property management and I know that property management typically is the key member of a team when you're expanding and, and set, you are now expanding um, across the United States. And I know you have uh, other uh, things outside of the United States as well. Um, but if you could help, us to understand like who are some of the other team members when you when you think about your team um overall yeah well uh the you know the cpa is a big one um you know the the bookkeeper the multiple attorneys so it's not it's not just to you know we're not we're not like we're not sugar happy when it comes to uh lawsuits but if you have you know if a house has you know if it catches on fire uh because you know, there was a small roof leak that developed out of nowhere, then water comes in and it lands on electrical wire, you know, something like that has happened and and the tenant was okay, thankfully. Um, And you have to file an insurance claim, the insurance company is naturally going to say no. So you have to have an insurance company, uh, insurance attorney ready, you know, landlord eviction attorneys, um, even just, you know, construction managers in each of the markets, uh, brokers, wholesalers, wholesalers have actually been really good sources for deal flow lately. Okay. Um, yeah. And just, I mean, the whole, the whole thing. So it's not, it's not, uh, thankfully, I mean, even, even though we invest in multiple States and got multiple management companies, when we have problems, I don't have to go to the markets to, to micromanage. Um, we use Dropbox, you know, the, all the team members, the property managers, the contractors, the leasing agents, they take before and after pictures. So it's like we have eyes on the ground and that's, that's a better way and a more a scalable way um, treating it like a factory, basically, like you, you, you add the property onto the conveyor belt and it goes through the first team It's the due diligence, you know, do the inspection reports. If it passes that, then it goes through closing, then it goes through property management contractor, then our, uh, our broker and we refinance it. And then we repeat it from the beginning. Love that. Love that. And so you, you've just talked about a number of the different team members, uh, right? Everything from potentially working with wholesalers, you've got your contractors, and you have the different types of attorneys, which I think is fantastic. And I know they're specifically when you're, when you're just in terms of ed, ed, helping to educate our viewers and listeners is really that, that special SEC attorney as well when you are syndicating or, or putting money together to go out and be able to acquire more and more property. So there is a specific type of attorney on your team that will help you to do that in a, in a legal way. Um, and also the fact that you're talking about how you use technology, Sep, this is one of the things I really believe that is important for us as we're going long distance in terms of investing, because the fact that I'm sitting here in Barcelona today and you're sitting in Orange County, California, and we can have this conversation, we're leveraging technology. And the same type of simplicity that we're having this conversation, you're also bringing to your business to be able to react in a fast manner to be proactive in terms of the way that you are communicating and setting up meetings uh, with your key team members, et cetera, et cetera. And it's also one of the things that makes it really easy, whether you're looking to do something very similar yourself or to tap in with teams that are already have the systems and processes in place. Right. And that, that's an important distinction to make too. So, cause when I started, I, I basically had to reinvent the wheel. I, I didn't, go into someone else's system. I had to build it through a lot of trials, a lot of mistakes mm-hmm. and failures. Uh, and I don't know if that's something where you talk about the difference between syndication or doing it yourself, but I, I think it's a really good idea with syndication where- Please, yeah, Seb, let, let's go ahead and let, let's unpack this. So talk, talk to us a little bit about it. I wanted to throw that out there, but yeah, let's talk to help people understand doing it yourself versus syndication. Yeah. So, uh, so you know, Billy is a, uh, is a real estate syndicator. So with a syndicator, it's kind of like, imagine, I mean, if, if your goal was to go build a phone, you could potentially do it yourself, but you, I'm an electrical engineer. I'm better with hardware than I am software. So I, it, it would be very challenging, uh, probably take years to go build a phone from scratch and do it. Um, I would rather go, uh, work with Apple and, you know, do it. Like if I was an investor, I want to invest in the next iPhone. I don't even know if they would take that, but it just as an example. So with, with working with syndication, syndication is that you get to syndication is basically you share the risk and you share the reward. So you could go buy a property and own it hundred percent, 
But then when mistakes happen, it's 100% on you. If, if you got the wrong management company, it's 100% on your experience. If you're working with a syndicator, then it's much bigger scale. So like instead of buying one or two houses at a time, uh, you could buy 50 or 100 houses. That gets the property management company's attention. That gets everyone excited because they know, you know, this, this is a longer lasting relationship. It's more profitable for everyone, all the team members. Um, so it's, it's like you get the benefits of the real estate without having to manage the property manager, have to go find the deals, have to uh, oversee the challenges that come up, you know, daily basis. And, and there are challenges, but you know, you and I like dealing with that, right. As, as operators and a lot of the investors that we work with, they don't, um, they've, they've dealt with tenants before and like, I never want to do that again. Uh, they don't necessarily want to put their money back in wall street. They, they would rather let their money go and work for them and not have to take the tenant or property management phone calls. Yeah, that's one one of the things that we that we do see a lot, and of course, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we're we're looking, you know, you're looking to get a result, and so to get that result, it's either you do the work yourself on a day to day basis, or you do the work up front and make sure that, as you talked about before, that you are working with the right teams, and those right and those teams have the the expertise, the knowledge, and the know how, and they're aligned with the result that you're looking for. So when you can keep things pretty simple that way. It it creates a a win win. So I'm I'm glad you took a, took a second there, Seth, to to unpack that the syndication and and just help people to understand once again what that is versus being able to uh, to do it themselves. Um, so Seth, one of the other things. So we we've talked about the the experience. We've talked about what as you look for team members, making sure that the right team members are on the bus. Uh, you've gone from Orange County. And you've gone beyond that. What help to give our listeners and our viewers an idea as to where is um, the Bacom Investment Group playing today? Uh, right? What are some of the different markets, and maybe why you've selected some of those different locations? Well, uh, the the current markets right now: Kansas City, uh, Missouri, Jacksonville, Florida, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we were invested in Texas for a while, and we we sold uh, everything over there about a year and a half ago, right before prices started really going up. Uh, right at, right before they kind of plateaued, rather. So the the good thing if you're if if you can invest if you can invest in teams and and systems, then you can be uh, what I like to call market agnostic. So I'm not mm -hmm. married to any particular market. If, um, and actually, uh, so one of the markets I mentioned, Kansas city was very close to passing rent control uh, four months ago. So I had to actually, that was, that was the first time I met the current property manager we have. I had to fly out to Kansas city and go to the city council um, to, you know, to help oppose that. Uh, if that would have passed, that would have been a game changer. Like that would have changed our decision to continue investing over there. But we have the luxury of doing that. Like if if it's just you know if we're only in you know one market and and we got to do everything ourselves, we have to self manage. Then we can't be as um, agnostic when it comes to that. Then the, the the investment has to make sense. It has to make sense for our investors. So we like to pick the markets that have good job growth. They're landlord friendly. It doesn't take months or years to evict a tenant that doesn't pay rent. Um, they they support entrepreneurs that want to go and improve the communities. Like we're not we're not just talking about going in and you know let's go raise the rent on poor people. Let's we're we're, we're looking at it in terms of well, let's bring houses that are offline online. Let's let's create more affordable housing. Uh, let's give them more for what they pay for in the rents. Like we don't we don't have to take advantage of them. Um, we can still help them and make a profit. So it's, um, you know, there's, there's other uh, markets we'd like to get into too, but I think the current markets that we're in will, will be busy for a while. Well, you know what, in, in the, the fact that you have been able to build teams, you've gone beyond your backyard, you've gone from Orange County, you've gone to Missouri, you've gone to Virginia, uh, to Florida, there is the same the foundation, which is making sure that you have the strong team, right? And so you being able to talk and even share some insights as to how you go about finding certain team members in locations that actually make sense for you, those that are investor friendly, uh, that allow investors to be able to operate in an efficient and an effective manner, and also um, being able to do that in a way that will help to create the type of uh, return or result that ultimately your investors are looking for. Uh, you, you've helped us to understand even more of that. Um, and so you, you are really helping to demonstrate just exactly what the whole Going Long podcast is all about, right? Being able to find the right location 
and be able to work with the the, the most effective teams uh, in that way. So, um, Sep, I you know at this point there were a couple of things that uh, that that I that I wanted to ask you, but I know that there's a lot of different things that are happening in the uh, in the world today. Uh, any particular things that you're seeing or doing differently with the way that either you're communicating with your teams or that you're selecting your teams um, because of you know where we are in the in the in the cycle? Yeah, well, uh, I'll, you know we're. we're we're not as affected as say like the airline industry is right now or, or, or short-term rentals. Um, if, you know, I, I like to use the example of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? So Abraham Maslow was, I think he was a psychologist and he came up with this like this pyramid where, you know, the bottom of that, if you Google it is, is what are the essentials with essentials for every single human being, every race, culture, everywhere throughout her, uh, throughout history. And on the top is the things that, I'll back up a little bit. If you can meet the essentials, then you can go up to the next level, right? You can, you can, you know, if you have food, if you have shelter, if you have water, then you're good. Then you can start actually going and reading books. You can actually go and, you know, go to bars. And then at the top is, you know, Disneyland and Airbnb and all that stuff. So I, I like to focus more on the bottom, like what are the essentials? Because those are, you know, like affordable housing. That, those are things that perform in good or bad times, right? There's a need for it. If people can't afford to live in Beverly Hills, they'll downsize into more affordable communities. So one of the things that we're changing recently um, with our, uh, just to you know, adapt with coronavirus is, uh, is instead of doing maybe some of the, um, you know, going just for market tenants, like, you know, non-subsidized, we're opening it up to section eight tenants and, uh, and focusing more on just keeping the houses more, more resilient. So we're doing away with carpet because we're assuming that if tenants move out, we don't want to have to, you know, have to change carpet every year because for, you know, for any of the listeners, carpet is like the worst thing you could put in, in a lot of the rentals because it's, it's, you know, it, it, it's cheaper than wood flooring or, or, uh, or, um, well, what's the other one? The like any of the stone floors, but you have to keep repeating that cost. But if you invest in a better quality product, then it makes the property more uh, more resilient. Um, property managers also working with the tenants, just calling them ahead of time. Um, you know, just making sure that they're okay, and if they are affected with what's going on, coronavirus, uh, they can lead them into um, you know connect them to the unemployment office or you know ways to get uh, assistance. So just being more proactive on that and. Um, you know, try trying to be more proactive than reactive until the you know the rent is due. So having the conversation with the tenants ahead of time uh, and preparing for that, that that's definitely a good, uh, you know big big takeaway right now. Okay, so staying more in contact with your with your property management teams, being able to adapt to the situation, not only on in terms of client or, or resident profile, also uh, the different amenities that you would have in this specific um, unit. So that makes, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, so listen, this has been, this has been really, really, I mean, like I said, this is just, <laughs> for me, this is such a pleasure. I, I love being able to chat with you. I love being able to see um, you and, and hear from you. And when you think about you getting started in, you know, back in 2008 and having gone through a, a down cycle, uh, really being, thinking a lot about how you didn't want to just have enough money to, you just, you didn't want to have be super, super rich. You wanted to be able to have money to survive, but you didn't want to be doing this in a way that was going to be 80 hours or a hundred hours a week and something that you didn't actually uh, enjoy all all the time where you started to see that there was something better. So that helped you to look for new opportunities outside of your, uh, outside of your nine to five. So you found that opportunity, you developed that over a series of years, you were able to walk away from your day job. You were able to also walk away from uh, Orange County in terms of as an investor. Um, since then, also been able to accumulate a number of assets and investors where you're delivering on your promise. Uh, you're now in multiple states. So uh, in, in Missouri, in Virginia, in, uh, in Florida, and uh, you continue to be able to attract new investors, you continue to focus on your own personal development. And I know that's something you being able to get out and, and connect with other people is something that's uh, amazing. And we see that you are continuing to grow uh, as an investor and really focused on building the right teams and doing that in places where it makes sense for investors and location agnostic. So, um, Seth, this has been awesome, man. This has really, really been cool. I'm sure that uh, everyone that's watching and listening has learned so much. 
And, uh, and I'd just like to ask you really kind of three questions to wrap things up today. Sounds good. All right, cool. So uh, the this is ready to ask our uh, top three questions here. So the first one, Sep, uh, with me living in Europe, and today you're in the States, in California. Love to know what is your favorite European city, either that you visited or it's on your it's on your dream list. Uh, I've been there, I think, three times now. It's Lake Como, Italy. Uh, it's just like a, I mean, you know, heaven on earth. So, and Barcelona is, is a close uh, second on there. It's beautiful too. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, we'd love to see you here in Barcelona. So, <laughs> let let us know. Let us know when you're ready to head over this way. Probably won't be right now, but uh, once we can start traveling around again, uh, I'd love to see you here. So, uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, in terms, second question. In terms of the the number one learning opportunity, right? So, the biggest mistake that you've made, and and what did you learn as a result of that mistake? So the, the biggest mistake is, is actually turning the mistakes of, of buying properties that, that were, were, you know, let's say they weren't A class and B class. They, they, were, they were challenging properties, high crime, uh, evictions, drugs, prostitutes, gangs, um, drive-by shootings, you know, properties that most investors don't want to touch, challenging properties. Um, solving those problems and instead of just uh, running away from it, thinking about, okay, well, if I had to do this again, what would I do differently and create a standard manual out of that? Like if, you know, if you, if you've had a challenging deal and if you look back and be like, if I had to do this again and I did it differently, knowing what I know now, would it be profitable? Would it be more profitable? And is it something I, I would enjoy doing? And for me, that, that was what, um, what the, you know, the aha moment was, is I do enjoy it. Like I do enjoy seeing the teams that we have improve the communities and the properties. But a lot of times, most of the times when, when investors buy something like a, in a bad neighborhood and they, you know, they get burned, they're like, I'm never going to do that again. I'm just going to go buy, you know, something else. So uh, look at, look at the mistakes, you know, don't, don't wear it like a, a scarlet letter or, you know, don't be ashamed of it, but look at it in terms of a, an opportunity. Like the properties we're investing in now, I never thought we would be investing in them 10 years ago. Okay. Awesome. So taking that once again as a process to learn, improve, and to make, uh, make it better on the, next, uh, on the next opportunity. So that's fantastic. And then at, one of the things that's closest to, to my heart, to our listeners and viewers' hearts, is really that personal development, that learning, that education. So um, I'd really like to know which book, and I know you've, you've already talked about uh, two different books, right? The, the um, Conspiracy of the Rich, and you've talked about Good to Great. And book that's made a big impact on you and, and what that impact is, uh, has been. Can I give two? Uh, cause I yes, think they would go hand in hand. Uh, one of them would be equity happens by Robert Helms and Russell Gray. Mm -hmm. Um, really good book just from a, a long-term snapshot of how, how real estate performs over the last 40, 50 years, even with the market cycles, uh, just a lot of good formulas and a lot of good lessons. Very, and it's, it's told in a story. So it's really good. And the second one is The Creature from Jekyll Island from G. Over Griffin. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal book on the Federal Reserve and just pulls the curtain back on uh, inflation and the loss in purchasing power. So those two books go hand in hand because you'll see, you'll see buying good real estate below replacement costs can be a good hedge against inflation. Yeah, that, that, uh, that book is, well, both of those books, the, the, I don't know. You, you can't see this on the on the if you're listening, but just over my shoulder is uh, <laughs> the creature from Jekyll Island. So, uh, yeah, definitely both wonderful books, a wonderful paradigm shifting uh, type of books, and uh, definitely I would yeah say pick those up because it's gonna it's gonna help you to be a much more informed uh, investor and just all around um, knowledge knowledge. So, uh, Sep, listen, this, like I said, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with our listeners, with our viewers today. And I really want everybody to have an opportunity to reach out to you, connect with you uh, as soon as possible. So Sep, can you help us understand what is the best way to connect with you? Sure. Yeah. They could, uh, visit the website. It's becominvestmentgroup.com. That's B E K A M investment group, or you can send me an email at Sep at thecommoninvest.com. I'm also on Facebook and, and LinkedIn too. So happy to connect and happy to help out. Awesome. So LinkedIn, Facebook, Sep at thecommoninvest.com. And you can also go to thecommoninvestmentgroup.com 
and uh, and check out Sepp and uh, and his team. So thank you so much, Sepp. And uh, it's been a pleasure. And really want to thank each and every one of you, the Going Pod, the Going Long podcast listeners and viewers. Uh, this is Billy Keels, and we're looking forward to uh, seeing you and hearing you on or hearing from you on the next episode. Thanks so much. Freedom. Wow. Don't you love hearing from top notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five-star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode, so go out and make it a great day.